from shutters to seats, from furniture to fireplaces, Pugin argued that the idea of Gothic could be applied to them all. And there's no better place to see those ideas put into action than at the home he built for himself here in Ramsgate, the Grange. The Grange is completely different from Georgian houses, which were designed to show a flat symmetrical front behind which the rooms were just fitted in. Here the house has been designed from the inside out, its exterior appearance driven by the interior use of space. It's recently been restored by the Landmark Trust. I'm meeting the conservation officer, Caroline Stanford, to learn how Pugin's life and work converged. Hello, I'm Richard. Hello, Caroline. Pleased to meet you. This is quite something. It's a very special space, I think, isn't it? You get a real sense of what Pugin was trying to do with his own home in, in this, this particular hallway. But it's quite radical. You'd never mistake this for a Georgian house. That's for sure, no. If, if you look here, you can see how the hallway is set at the centre of the house. Mm. And then you've got all the rooms spinning off this central space mm. in a centripetal way, almost. So everything, even the arrangement, is swirling around. Exactly. It's really a very dynamic space. There's a sense of movement all the way around, the mm. stairs shooting up in one direction, these open galleries around, and then his own personal wallpaper, this outrageous diagonal design with his personal motto, en avant, upwards, ever onwards, you feel. Is it a bit much? You're surrounded by his crest and his initials. It is, isn't it? This was a very dynamic, almost self-absorbed individual who was just bursting with life and his ideas and his designs. Mm. Everything in the house, from floor tiles to banisters, is so overwhelming with its sense of Gothic that it blurs the line between genius and madness. So this is the dining room. Um, yes, the wallpaper is the original colourway. Fairly mad, but that's what he had. The candlesticks are nice examples of the sort of metalwork that the Hardman Studios would have sent out across the whole country. And even the doorknob is gothic. <laughs> so Gothic doorknobs. Look at the little escutcheon and the nice segmented knob. All of these infused by the spirit of the Middle Ages and yet produced in the most modern techniques. Mm, fantastic. Nowhere in the house better demonstrates Pugin's gothic obsession than his library, where everything from the pieces on the bookshelves to the inscriptions on the wall was meant to saturate him in the medieval. And we can imagine him sitting here at his desk working, but he's also, he's surrounded all the way around the room on this frieze by the names and coats of arms of places and people that he loved. So we've got the great cathedrals of Britain, we've got saints, we've got patrons, we've got family names. Mm. This was meant to give him inspiration. Yes, and it's the most personal room we have for Pugin the man, I think. Mm. Married for a third time, Pugin would base himself at the Grange for the rest of his life. Cloistered in his Gothic world, he became even more fixated on his vision. The great exhibition at Hyde Park was intended to showcase the best in design and manufacturing. Pugin leapt at the opportunity. Typically innovative, he entered a huge multifaceted exhibit, inevitably on Gothic lines. When the exhibition opened in 1851, Pugin's medieval court, with its statues, wall hangings and metalwork produced by his old collaborators Myers, Crace and Hardman, was a big hit with the public and critics alike. The illustrated London news was particularly fulsome. To Mr Pugin is due the highest honour, it said, for demonstrating the applicability of the medieval arts in all their richness and complexity to the uses of the present age. But when the prizes for the exhibits were awarded, Pugin lost out. 
The categories were organized around manufacturers and Pugin, as a designer, just didn't fit into them. So once again, the fact that he was so ahead of his time actually counted against him. Plunged into depression, Pugin began to suffer momentary blackouts. His finances remained shaky, due largely to the cost of the church he was building next door to the Grange, St. Augustine's. Although this church is very obviously Gothic, it marks yet another departure for Pugin. Rather than the rising vertical lines, there are horizontal lines holding it permanently in place. And between them, this beautiful napped flint that seems to rise up from the cliffs underneath it. The church also marks a departure from Pugin's earlier work when it comes to the interiors. Unlike St. Giles Cheadle, or the eye-popping details of the Grange, St. Augustine's is calm, serene, simple. It's a fact that's making the job of restoring the church that much easier. Paul Sharrock is the architect in charge. Paul, oh, this place is gorgeous. It is, isn't it? I mean, this is Pugin's vision. This was Pugin designing for himself. And this is his Catholic vision of design. What restoration work are you undertaking? The building is extremely well built, but it's 170 years old now, and we have problems with the roofs, and we have some problems with the tower, electrics, which are not his problem, <laughs> um, but are ours. Uh, so there are a number of things of that nature. But what is surprising is actually everywhere you look is how the craftsmanship has stood up. Do you think he had something that we've lost today? Yes, I do. And in a way, this building, I think, captures it. This building for him was an act of faith. It was saying, this is how I believe the Catholic Church should be. And it's, it's that kind of personal feeling that you have of a man who spent over £14,000 of his own money building this building. An astonishing amount of money. Because you could build a church then for... £1,500? Right, so it's ten times. I mean, an enormous sum of money. The cost of St Augustine's was a constant drain on Pugin's finances, and he was never able to afford its spire. To meet its expense, he took on more and more work, but only at a cost to his fragile health. Then, a few weeks before Pugin's 40th birthday, Barry came to the Grange to discuss the Palace of Westminster's most prominent feature, the clock tower for Big Ben. The design of this landmark feature had been under discussion for years. Several designs had been submitted and rejected, and in desperation, Barry turned once again to Pugin to come up with a fitting solution. Suffering from piles, worms, bouts of narcolepsy and apocalyptic visions, Pugin, with one final flash of inspiration, produced his most famous work. The Tower of Big Ben is one of those buildings that you've seen so many times that you stop seeing it for looking. But it's absolutely lovely. It rises up from the ground in this stately rhythm, higher and higher, before you reach the clock face, picked out as a giant rose, its petals fringed with gold. There's some medieval windows above that, and then you hit the grey slate roof, its greyness relieved by these delicate little windows again, picked out in gold leaf. And then it rises up again in this great jet of gold to the higher roof that curves gracefully upwards to a spire with a crown and flowers and a cross. It's elegant, it's grand, it's pretty. It has this fairy tale quality and it makes you proud to be British. Too ill to work anymore, Pugin wouldn't live to see his design built. In 
February 1852, he suffered a mental breakdown on a trip to London, unable to recognise even his closest friends. Some said this was down to overwork, some said it was down to the medication he was taking, but whatever the reason, he was consigned to Bedlam for several months before his wife Jane was able to take him home. He never really recovered, and on the 14th of September 1852, he died, aged just 40. Pugin's tomb, here in his own church of St. Augustine, is decorated with carvings of his family. His three wives, Anne, Louisa, and Jane, are illuminated in the stained glass above him. When someone dies, it can be an opportunity to reassess their life and acknowledge everything that they've achieved. But even that was denied Pugin. His death coincided with that of another Kent resident, the Duke of Wellington. Wellington's death plunged the whole nation into mourning and Pugin to the back pages of history. In life, Pugin never received due credit, and in death, he was sidelined for over a century. But recently, there's been a reappraisal. Pugin was, perhaps, the one architect whose sense of the spiritual shaped the face of the Britain we know. His work underpins so much of what we see, whether it's pumping stations to the Palace of Westminster, town halls to village churches, our high streets, everything would be different. We have to think of him as an utterly inspirational figure. The amount that he achieved in his lifetime really has to be an inspiration to us all. I think he is very comparable with Brunel. If one thinks of these two half French little boys who between them remade the 19th century landscape. Every time Brunel built a railway line, Pugin went down it and built a church. Pugin's legacy is very much around us. You can see it, for example, in the work of our high-tech architects, Norman Foster, Richard Rogers, Nicholas Grimshaw, for example. If you work in the office of one of these architects today, you'll soon realise that even the smallest detail of their building is designed as part of a coherent architectural language which speaks of the whole nature of the building, and this is very much part of Pugin's message. There's no doubt that if Pugin had never lived, Britain simply wouldn't look the way it does today. But it's about more than just a look. It's about a vision, a vision of architecture as a moral force, a force for good. And it's a vision that's as relevant today as it ever was then. And that is why we should remember the name of Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin. Our brand new series, Charting the Crusades, continues here on BBC HD at 9 o'clock on Wednesday. And coming up next tonight, another chance to catch Wonderland. <laughs>